Hello brothers and sisters. Um, in this video, we're going to focus on learning about uh, lessons from the false prophet Balaam. Now some of you might wonder, well, what can Balaam teach us? But what Balaam did, what Balaam said, um, how he's covered in the New Testament, held up as a false teacher, a false prophet, he he becomes an example to us to help us learn how to spot these false teachers nowadays. Uh, when you look at him, uh, his story, and the things that happened, um, and then you see how he's talked about in the New Testament and held up as an example of a false prophet, um, it will help you to better understand how to spot these false teachers today. And some folks may not understand why, for example, I would stand against certain teachers who, while they seem to spout off uh, free grace and talking about um, eternal security and salvation by faith alone, yet out of the other side of their mouth, these, they're spouting off these horrible false doctrines that demote and demean Christ, that say he's not the eternal Son of God, and they teach false Gnostic teachings that angels cohabitated with women, and things like uh, denying the eternality of the lake of fire. Um, these, these folks that teach such things are like soothsayers, and their wicked doctrine really shows their wicked heart. And so there is much to learn uh, from uh, what is presented to us regarding the false prophet Balaam. And when we look at him in the Old Testament, we definitely see God's sovereignty. And it also shows that no matter how eloquent and truthful sounding the person is, they are judged um, by their fruit and that is doctrine fruit is doctrine and I have a video on that on this channel from way back but there is uh, quite a bit to cover and um, I just now noticed that I seem to have forgot my Bible <laughs> but I'm gonna pull one out here off the wall in fact, I think I'm going to use the King James Bible that my grandmother gave me when I was just a wee lad in the old country. I'm kidding. I was about eight or nine years old. Let's see. Oh, it was presented to me on March 1st, 1977. So I would have been about, yeah, almost nine years old. One of those award Bibles. But I've had it all these years, and it's falling apart, but it's falling apart because it was red. <laughs> and we are going to pick up with the story of Balaam in Numbers chapter 22. So let's get back to Numbers chapter 22. And uh, there's going to be a lot of reading in this, and I'm quite sure I will not be able to get it all done in one sitting because it's going to be rather lengthy. I don't want to cut any corners with this. Um, I want to emphasize the points several times because it's very important to see how the Word of God is built line upon line and precept upon precept. So we're going to start out in Numbers uh, chapter 22 and we're first going to read uh, the first 18 verses so that way we get the, the storyline of what's going on chapter 22 of Numbers beginning in verse 1 and the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho and Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. 
And Moab was sore afraid of the people, because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they, are, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. What there means no. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. Now the Old Testament law warns us against divination. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me, and the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them, peradventure I shall be able to overcome them, and drive them out. And God had said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning, and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak, and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam, and said to him, Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. <clears throat> so, here we have the opening storyline of Balaam. Now, the words of Balaam are such that on the surface, just a simple reading of the scripture, one would think, oh, he must be a prophet of God. Why, um, he says, look what he says there in verse 18, folks. He says, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now that's something I want you to understand regarding false teachers. False teachers today, they will claim God as their God. But God did not claim Balaam. Now he spoke in such a manner that it made it sound like he was certainly one of God's prophets. And some would even dare teach that perhaps he was one of God's prophets, but somehow he fell out of favor. But that would be the bunch that denies eternal security. That would be the Ruckmanites, the Brian Denlinger type, that would say that perhaps he was saved, fell away from God, God was displeased. And because it was the Old Testament, you know, and you had to have a certain measure of works, um, why he just fell out of favor and somehow... God was upset with him, and, you know, he met a really bad end. But that's not what the scripture says. We know full well that he was a false prophet, uh, because we're told in the New Testament. We also know what the end of him was, and that 
Uh, we're going to get to that at the very end. But Balaam spoke eloquently. And, and I have to say that some of these teachers, uh, even especially among uh, the so-called King James Bible group, they'll speak very eloquently, very uh, knowledgeable per se, but then something just isn't quite right. It's like they speak of a God that they really don't know. And what gives them away? The only thing that we can really judge and look at is their doctrine. The words coming out of their mouth are false. They'll speak of the grace of God and yet deny the Lord that bought them, as it says in 2 Peter. And we're going to get to those verses. I have a lot of verses to cover. This is probably going to be a rather lengthy study. Um, but you can tell because of their doctrine what they really teach. Now, Satan is a counterfeiter. He'll mimic, he'll imitate, but he there is no truth in him. You know, you can have a false teacher say the exact same things that a true teacher of God says, but then there's just something about it that's not quite right. There's some underlying pillar or some underlying foundation of their whole doctrine that messes up everything else. And one of those things is uh, people that I have pointed out before on this channel that teach the big lie that Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son of God. And people say, Kevin, you make too big of a deal out of that. They haven't denied that Jesus is God. They haven't denied that um, Jesus is even the Son of God. But yes, they have. You completely and totally destroy the Trinity. When you deny the eternal sonship of Christ, it all falls flat. Because if you don't have an eternal son, that glorious person, the Son of God, then you don't have an eternal father. And then what do you do with the Holy Spirit? Um, the entire doctrine of the Trinity collapses. And I am speaking about not people like Brian Denlinger, who is way outside of the norm on that anyways, who teaches that Jesus is the Father and other modalism garbage. No, I'm talking about the others that, that people have like heard me teach this and then turned their back on the truth and went after the false teachers, and they defend the false teachers. If Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son of God, he is false. Because if he is not always the Son of God being his very nature, his, in his very person, then that means he became the Son of God, and you have a created God. And as you know, God can't be created. But Jesus wasn't a nameless entity in the Old Testament and then became the Son of God in the New Testament. He became the Son of Man, but he has always been the Son of God. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. He says in Malachi, I am the Lord, I change not. So, you really have no different version of Jesus Christ than, say, the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Mormons, of course, teach that Jesus progressed to Godhood. Well, what does uh, eternal uh, sonship deniers say? Well, that he became the Son of God at his incarnation. And what do the Jehovah's Witnesses teach? That, that Jesus Christ uh, uh, became a Son of God. So, you still have a less than God teaching by denying the eternal Sonship of Christ. And yet, it is the most insidious and um, subtle very crafty, very subtle teaching that undermines the entire um, platform, the entire foundation of Christianity because really it's no different than Jehovah's Witnesses who say that Jesus was a created being, that Jehovah created him. Um, this simply cannot be the case and those who continue in this, who, who continue in these falsehoods, they these teachers, they reveal who they really are. They reveal their nature. They reveal the false spirit. Um, just read 
1 John chapter 4. Uh, very insightful in helping us to understand that if they do not acknowledge the Son, they don't have the Father either. It, you can't have it both ways. Um, if Jesus became the Son of God at his incarnation, then at that point in time, the Father became the Father. And that simply isn't so. We have scripture after scripture that tells us otherwise. So, what I want to really point out here that I want to drive home is in verse 18 of Numbers 22, um, he sounds, Balaam here sounds so uh, eloquent, so truthful, so humble. Uh, look what he says. Let's read it again. If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, uh, you see, see that? If he would just, if he would give me all of his silver and gold, um, it makes it sound like he's not greedy at all, doesn't it? It makes it sound like he's so humble, uh, he's not in anything for the money, he sure don't care about money. <clears throat> That's not his objective in life. He says, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, that is certainly something to say as a Christian. Um, as believers in Jesus Christ, uh, we say those words, we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, we don't care about the wealth of this world. We have a home in heaven. Uh, up there, gold is used for pavement, brothers and sisters. Um, the, the gate, the entrance of the gate is pearl. Uh, there is wealth untold there. And so uh, we long for that city. We long to dwell there with our holy God, with the saints, the holy angels. And <clears throat> we're looking for that city. We're looking for that home. But you see these false teachers nowadays. You have uh, the likes of Benny Hinn who... Um, and Jan and Paul Crouch, uh, who've since passed away, and, uh, well, they know the truth now, don't they? But they cared about nothing but money. You have Kenneth Copeland, who brags about being a billionaire. You know, he's got one foot in the grave, and he's, he's getting close to facing Jesus, and that money's not going to do him a bit of good. But here... This is something that a Christian would say, you know, if you would give me all your house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Because a true Christian would say that, and, and it would be true because we're focused on nothing but the Lord Jesus. We're, we're not looking for such material gain in this world to, um, to because we know that the foundation of, of this world, the it's passing away. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Gold is not that important. Um, to be content with what we have, to, to live our lives and God provides for us and looks after us, that's, that's what's important. And God takes care of those things. You know, the righteous do not need to go begging for bread. God provides for us. He looks after us. Uh, and so... When Balaam says something like that, it kind of takes you back and says, oh, wait, maybe he's a real prophet. Because in my youth, I couldn't quite understand why, um, why Balaam ended up that way. And it took a long time for me to understand that these false teachers today can say the exact same things that true Christians say. It's just that they don't believe it. It's just that they don't really have the Holy Spirit, but um, they appear as ministers of righteousness, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. Um, they have their own agenda, and whether it's money or whether it's uh, notoriety and to be looked up to as some kind of great person, um, only God knows those things. But, but we have Balaam here saying something that quite plausible for a Christian to say, but we know in the end that Balaam is held up as a false prophet, and he did not belong to God. Now, I want to look at something else here. Um, I want to do some contrasts here in this, in this section of Scripture, okay? Look, look at verse 20. Um, and God came unto Balaam at night, and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. So God tells him, 
the if the men call, go with them. So God gives them permission, right? And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Look at verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. It's like Balaam is not going to win. He cannot win for losing. God tells him to go and yet turns right around and his anger is kindled because he did go. Now, brothers and sisters, that's not so with the Christian. That's not so with the saints. God gives us direction through his word, through the Holy Spirit. Um, as we listen to him, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, God will give us direction. But God is not going to tell us as Christians to go do this or go do that and then punish us. It does not work that way. However, with the false prophet, the false prophet is not going to win. Um, God's anger, verse 22, was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass. Now notice this phrase here, um, for an adversary against him. Is God our adversary? No. We've made peace with God. We've been reconciled um, to the Father through the shed blood of Jesus Christ by putting our faith in the person of Christ, by believing in him, by trusting what he says in his word, believing what he did for us. We have been reconciled to God. Is he our adversary now? No. Unto him we cry, Abba, Father. We've been adopted as sons now and daughters and joint heirs with Christ. Um, there is nothing that shall separate us from the love of God, according to Romans chapter 8, the last couple of verses. Let's just read that real quick. Probably my most favorite scripture in the New Testament. Romans chapter 8. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, does the Lord Jesus show up in front of us as an adversary along the way? No, he does not. We're now joint heirs with Christ. We've been adopted. We've been given that wonderful position in Christ. We've been baptized into Christ through the might and power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit baptism, sealed and secure till that day of redemption. And there is nothing that comes between us. He is not going to come out as an adversary against the saint. Um, he guides us and teaches us and is meek and and gives us, us his spirit to help us to grow thereby. But not so with Balaam. Here we see with Balaam. God tells him to go, so he goes, and then God's anger is kindled. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and a sword drawn in his hand and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. So he takes his anger out on the animal. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. Now, this ass had a whole lot more sense than Balaam did. And Balaam's anger was kindled and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto me that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. 
Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, and here we see. Here we see. Here is the key, brothers and sisters. Because thy way is perverse before me. There you go. He did not belong to God. His way was perverse before him. Whereas with us, what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So where we're in Christ, we're baptized into Christ through the Holy Spirit. Our way is not perverse before him because we belong to him, because our way is his way. He is the way, and we're in Christ. And so therefore, his way becomes our way. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times, unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. <laughs> he says, Balaam, I'd only kill you. I'm not going to kill your donkey. Uh, I, I like the donkey apparently a lot more than you, <laughs> it would seem. Um, he was not pleased with Balaam whatsoever. But uh, God's anger was kindled against Balaam. It certainly wasn't against the donkey. And he said, I... Um, now, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. Now I want you to notice something about the false teachers. Um, sometimes they'll admit, yes, they've sinned. They've done this or that or the other. Um, does that make them belong to God? No, Balaam said here, he admitted that he sinned. For I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto me, unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. And when Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him unto a city of Moab, which is in the border of Arnon, which is in the utmost coast. And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore camest thou not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote thee to honor? And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. So here we see the sovereignty of God. Balaam clearly did not belong to the Lord, but clearly God has sovereignty, and um, things are going to get done God's way. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came unto Kirjath Huzoth. And Balak offered oxen and sheep, and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. There were so many people of the tribes of the children of Israel that you couldn't even see them all. There were so many that he could only see the utmost part of them, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Now, this is where we're going to leave it right now. Um, there is so much to cover on this, and, and I don't want to cut any corners at all. Uh, but... The Bible, when you put all these scriptures together, you see this true story of how false prophets are in the Old Testament, how false teachers are in the New Testament. And we begin to understand why it is so very important to not fellowship with those and to break fellowship with those who have false doctrine, who teach things, soothsaying words like, the lake of fire doesn't really burn forever. And, you know, Jesus is still God, even though he just became God's son at um, the incarnation. And, and these other false teachings. 
um, it really shows their heart. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And we know, based upon these false teachers' doctrines, where they really stand um, with God. Because God is no respecter of persons. And, and I say that even though these false teachers teach what they teach, that they don't have to end up like Balaam. While there's still breath in their body, they can still believe the truth. Um, it's not too late for them yet if they choose to believe. God is merciful. God is good. So, until next time, God bless you and take care.